Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week. Lots to talk about once again regarding SpaceX Starship development, launch news from the last week, and we have a very major Rocket Lab flight slated to take place over the course of the next week. So let's get into things. The nose cone of Ship 24 is still sitting in the high bay awaiting stacking. We were kind of hoping that this would have taken place over the past week, but I guess the Starbase crew are juggling so many tasks that they have to prioritize some things over others. So looks like the complete stacking of Ship 24 is going to have to wait a little bit longer. Hopefully this should take place either this week or next week. The nose cone itself is such an improvement over previous iterations, certainly with regards to the heat shield. But I mean, compare it to this nose cone. C. Nunes Images took this picture on February the 17th, 2020. Which ship prototype is this? First one to get it right in the comments down below wins, I don't know, the satisfaction of being correct? On your marks, get set, go! <laughs> Alongside Ship 24's nose cone in the high bay is Booster 8, which is continuing to spring up as workers continue the ring stacking process. We also saw the sad but expected scene of SpaceX finally begin the scrapping of Ship 21. We've seen very little progress around this prototype ever since it was rolled out, so we had suspected that SpaceX didn't really have any plans for it, and now it looks like it's officially getting chopped up. I gotta say though, my favourite Starship image of the past week has got to go to Nick Antuini for his caption, the FAA review will be done soon. Soon? Soon? <laughs> We've been watching the wide bay grow for quite some time now, and it looks like completion is tantalizingly close. Last week, I reported on the mounting of the building's classy bridge crane, and now SpaceX have begun installing the roof. Lolo Matiko 3D shared this render of what it would probably look like to stand inside the bay, looking upward. Give them a follow on Twitter if you want to see more. I especially love their overview shot of the orbital tank farm. It can be hard to get a sense of the layout of things from the odd ground shots and drone angles that we see, so this is a really good resource to get a clear sense of where everything is. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, shared a brief video of him and Elon gazing down on the launch area from the pad tower. Not only was this a really cool view to see, really puts into perspective the scale of this place, but the caption implied that we might be getting another Starbase interview with Elon Musk in the near future. Here's hoping. If you've not seen Tim's previous Starbase tour with Elon, then I highly recommend checking it out. So much was learned in that series. We've been wondering about the fate of Ship 20. We've obviously had it confirmed that Ship 20 and Booster 4 won't be used for the first orbital flight test, but we thought that SpaceX might have still wanted to perform a test flight of Ship 20 in order to see how the heat shield tiles withstand the vibrations and forces from flight, either in a similar high altitude hop test akin to SN8 to 15, or a hypersonic flight test that at one point SN16 was being considered for. However, last week all of Ship 20's flight recorders were removed, pretty much placing the final nail in the coffin for a flight of this machine. Rest in peace, Flight 420. Bring on Flight 247. Please? Please, FAA? <laughs> ship 24 will not only be the first orbital starship, but it will also be the first payload-capable starship, in that it'll sport a small hatch designed for the deployment of Starlink satellites. Eric and Small Stars created this animation of how this would potentially look in space, and this past week, SpaceX 3D Creation Eccentric shared some detailed cutaways of this system, giving us a really interesting perspective of the deployment mechanism. Whether or not this prototype cargo bay is kept by SpaceX remains to be seen. We'll have to just watch this one very closely. SpaceX's Falcon 9 saw a successful nighttime launch from the Vandenberg launch site at the end of last week. This launch took place on Sunday the 17th of April, and the payload was the NROL-85 mission. The NROL spacecraft are highly classified satellites for the American government, and as such, very little is known about the specifics of what the NROL-85 mission actually involves. But regardless, the launch went very well, and main engine cutoff occurred at just over two minutes after the launch, after which the first stage conducted its boost back burn to head back towards Vandenberg. By nature of the ground-based landing site, we got some awesome views of the landing approximately eight minutes after launch. After the landing was over, SpaceX weren't able to continue the live stream as they weren't able to show any shots of the second stage at the request of the US Space Force, so the live stream ended here. This is the second successful landing for this particular Falcon 9 first stage. It previously supported the NROL-87 mission on the 2nd of February. Rooklan once again supplies us with a great infographic of the overview of this rocket's history, as well as this nice diagram of the rocket we saw in last week's launch. SpaceX of course planned to perform 60 launches in 2022, 
And as you can see, this launch puts them at 23.3% into meeting this objective. Python Space shared this video of a test of their rocket, and it's got quite a few people slightly alarmed about their safety measures, or lack thereof. Python Space is a small startup based in California and has the big ambition of flying to Mars in either 2024 or 2026. They're building a rocket, an interplanetary spacecraft, and a Mars lander. Their first goal, though, is to construct a small orbital rocket named Eager, which will be able to place up to 150 kilograms of payload in low Earth orbit. A few weeks ago, on the 19th of March, they conducted a hold-down test of the Eager's first stage with a single engine. The final vehicle will have nine of these. This test was filmed and uploaded to Vimeo, and it went largely unnoticed until a recent article by Eric Berger for Ars Technica brought it into the spotlight. The video reveals quite an alarming number of instances where the Python employees make not very OSHA-compliant moves. First of all, the rocket tank was lifted vertically by using two of its very flimsy-looking legs, as the fulcrum, with workers standing right in the crush zone should anything have snapped or otherwise given way. It also shows workers apparently running away from the expanding plume of dust and exhaust. And no, the plume isn't that yellow colour because of the desert sand. This rocket uses toxic hypergolic propellants. You know, that really dangerous stuff that you shouldn't breathe in? It really doesn't appear that Python took that much thought to proper safety of its employees at all here. There were many replies to Eric's tweet, including some notable rocket scientists, such as Jordan Noon, the co-founder of Relativity Space, who wrote, We knew better as untrained college students. Python Space didn't directly reply to the Ars Technica article, apart from sneakily re-uploading an edited version of the video that removed this shot of the fleeing employees. Though they apparently did reply to an earlier message from someone in the industry over safety concerns, asserting that the aerospace official was being condescending and misinformed, before adding that, You completely lack knowledge of our safety procedures, but yet run to quick conclusions and judgement. Interesting take there, Python. Given that SpaceX is still years away from reaching Mars and are now over 20 years old and have far more to show for themselves than Python, perhaps Python's lofty goals of a Mars landing in two to four years is a bit of a stretch. And for me, this video doesn't really instill much faith. But of course, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Construction of the Saxavord spaceport is set to begin very soon now. Saxavord spaceport will be located on the Shetland Islands and is planned to have three launch pads on Lamba Ness Peninsula on the island of Unst. When operational, this spaceport will host the first British vertical orbital rocket launch, which is currently slated to take place this year. The rocket will be the RS-1 Smallsat launcher rocket, produced by California-based company ABL Space. The work we'll start seeing begin over the next month or so won't be too glamorous. The initial phase of construction will be the construction of a new road and an upgrade to the existing access roads of the island. Still, it's going to be great seeing rocket launches happening from the United Kingdom. The other spaceport we have is actually fairly close to where I live, Spaceport Cornwall, but this is more of an airport really, since it's a planned location for Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1 rocket. Not as exciting as a vertical rocket launch platform, in my opinion. The Chinese Space Agency had a very busy week. On Friday, they launched a Long March 3B, which carried the China Sat 6D satellite, which is a communication satellite designed to provide reliable, stable, and safe radio and television transmission and communication services, replacing the aging China Sat 6A, which was launched in 2010. On the same day as this launch, China also launched a Long March 4C, this rocket carrying the AEMS, which stands for Atmospheric Environment Monitoring Satellite. Official sources have reported that the satellite has entered its desired orbit, and the AEMS is described as the world's first satellite with carbon dioxide laser detection capability, capable of all-day detection of carbon dioxide with high precision. China didn't just send stuff to low orbit last week, they also brought stuff back to Earth. Stuff being the crew of the Shenzhou-13 mission. The Shenzhou-13 crew spacecraft undocked from the radial port of the Tianhe core module on Friday, carrying Taikonauts Zai Zigang, Yi Guangfu, and Wang Yaping, I'm so sorry about my pronunciation of Chinese names by the way, who have completed the first ever six-month mission on the Chinese space station. After a safe re-entry, the crew landed at the Dongfeng landing site in the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region a few hours later, and they made a safe egress shortly after. Looks like they're all in good shape. Now, this coming week will have a very exciting launch. Rocket Lab will be conducting its 26th Electron mission. So far, Electron has served as an expendable launch vehicle. However, Rocket Lab have been taking progressive steps to make the first stage reusable, in much the same way as Falcon 9. We've seen Rocket Lab perform three launches now, where the first stage has parachuted back down to Earth after launch, splashing down in the ocean and later recovered by boat. 
However, the ultimate goal of Rocket Lab is to pluck the falling booster out of the air using a helicopter, thus avoiding all the damage posed by submersing the booster in salt water. This week, Rocket Lab will make their first catch attempt of a live rocket stage. The Electron will take off, carrying a number of small rideshare payloads, and then the first stage will fall back to Earth and deploy its parachute. Once it's through the upper parts of the atmosphere, a helicopter will fly in and hook onto the booster, catching it from the skies and then flying it to the recovery zone. It's highly unlikely that Rocket Lab will refly this particular booster. In all likelihood, they'll just strip it down and inspect it to assess the feasibility of reflying Electron and if any upgrades need to be made. Though we may end up seeing a static fire or another test of the booster once all this is done. Time will tell. The launch window for this flight starts on the 19th of April, so tomorrow, and will last for 14 days. The other thing we'll likely see very soon will be the rollback of SLS and Orion back to the Vehicle Assembly building in order to replace the faulty upper stage check valve that's been causing a few issues with the rocket's wet dress rehearsal, as well as fix a small leak on the tail service mast umbilical. NASA will be holding a media teleconference at 3pm Eastern Daylight Time today, April the 18th, where we'll learn more about the status of NASA's mega rocket. Hopefully this won't cause too much more delay with the vehicle and that we may finally get to see it fly this year. Gonna be great when that happens. Hopefully I'll get to talk about it very soon in one of these videos, which are possible thanks to the generosity of my patrons and channel members. If you want to help support what I do here then there are links to sign up below or on screen. You get these videos a day early and channel members get exclusive emojis that you no doubt seen spammed in the comments below. <laughs> Otherwise there are two other videos from my channel on screen that the algorithm thinks you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks. And uh, yes, thanks for flying with me today and I'll see you all next time. Oh, and there's a new couple video on Saturday. Just letting you guys know. <laughs>